Church, say amen again. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Grandview Academy. That was very nice. Are we okay there? Wonderful. Thank you so much for blessing us with that. Those two beautiful messages and song. And uh, that last one happens to be one of my favorite ones. I remember singing that when I was about your age. Make me a servant. And uh, God has somehow fulfilled that song in my life to continue to be God's servant and serving God. And you don't, by the way, you don't have to be a pastor to serve God. Whatever calling, whatever vocation that you're in becomes your ministry when given back to and consecrated to God. Did you know that? I hope you know that. So whatever you are, whatever God has called you to be, be the best. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, if God calls you to be a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper. And uh, whatever it is, a teacher, a dentist, a lawyer, whatever your profession, may you give it back to God for his service, for his honor, for his glory. You know, um, I must say, you know, it's not every day we have uh, our uh, Christian Academy with us. And um, I, I want to say that you know, we do have our children, some of our children here attend a Christian Academy, attend a Christian Academy in Oakville here, and then we have our Grandview Adventist Academy, which is our closest uh, Adventist Christian school. And not everyone, not every child can attend um, our Christian schools and our Adventist schools, and that's understandable. But those who can and those who uh, have, it, it is a blessing, a great blessing, to see them wearing that uniform, and uh, you'll never hear, and I'm not saying those who go to public school don't benefit or they're not blessed. I'm not saying that, so make sure you understand what I'm saying contextually. But you'll never hear children sing that type of song in a public school. Never. And uh, that's, that's the benefit of and value of attending Christian school and, and our school, Adventist Christian Education. So I just want to... Make a plug and praise God for Adventist Christian education. Thank God for our teachers who are very dedicated. I salute you and I commend you. I must say that because I also attended um, academy and um, it was a blessing and benefit in my life. And I praise God for the many things I learned there. So thank you so much for ministering to us. Praise God. Well, uh, we have a full house and particularly because we have visitors from Grandview, but uh, we have some faces we haven't seen today or for a long time that we see today and welcome back home members who've been away and uh, we have our some of our students have gone back I know Abby has gone back he was with us briefly last week and week before and then we you know we know of our college university students who've gone back to school God God be with you and bless you as you have started your uh, new year or continue your academic year and give you some success um, someone came to you and says, oh yeah, I came today because I heard it was your last sermon. It's not my last sermon yet. I said, you know, I was going to say, my man, don't push me out too soon. I'm not, I'm not going to go that easy. That's not so soon. But uh, it, is, um, it is my second last sermon, of course. And we continue our series called Renewing the Covenant. Renewing the Covenant. And in, our message for today is entitled Quality Assurance Christianity. Quality Assurance Christianity. So... I hope that you will journey with me for the next few moments together as we open God's Word. Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll launch into our message for today. Let's pray. Loving Lord Jesus, you've done it again. You've woke us up this morning. You breathed into our bodies the breath of life. We thank you for calming the winter weather from yesterday's storm, Lord, and giving us sunshine today. Though it's cold on the outside, we thank you for your presence that warms us and that gives us that holy fire through your Holy Spirit. Come by and enlighten our minds, remove every distraction, and may you be our main attraction because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Covenant. You've heard me talk about covenant many times, right? And you probably wonder, why do I make so much emphasis on the covenant? What's so big about the covenant? Well, many of you who are married, I would say, what, 80% of you that are married, you made a covenant, a covenantal vows you took before the altar. Covenants are also made for other agreements and all of that. And so today we're going to talk about the covenant, but there's a uniqueness about the covenant with God. A covenant with God is one that is, of course, you see that red there, it, it, it signifies the, 
the importance or the sacrifice that has been made. Every covenant is attached or affiliated with a sacrifice. And a covenant with God requires that type of sacrifice. Now, I'll explain that to you. doesn't mean God is saying you have to go and slay yourself. That's not the type of. But he says that we should present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Romans says that. Paul says that in Romans chapter 12. But the covenant signifies something even greater, of greater importance. And that is, you and I have a living relationship with the living God. That is the importance of this covenant. And so it is really the pursuit of God. God pursuing you and I. You and I. God pursuing us. That covenant seals and signifies our relationship with Him. Now, quality assurance. You've heard that term before. How many of you work in the quality assurance industry? Or related, right? You understand what I'm talking about when we use the term quality assurance, right? You understand what that means. That from the uh, beginning of a product to the end of the product or the finished product, there is a process that entails a series of steps to ensure that quality assurance is followed from the very beginning to the finished product. Does that make sense? Everything, like today, anything that you purchase and buy, there is a start and there's a finish, but there's a process in between. It just doesn't start and finish by the snap of a finger or by the blink of an eye. There is intentional efforts that are taken to ensure that that product meets certain criteria and standard to get it to where it needs to be, d- be done as a finished product. Then it is signed off by the inspector. It could be an inspector for clothing, for food, for a house, for a car, whatever that purchased product might be that you have obtained. There's a sign up. And you know, there's some closure items you buy, right? And it comes with tags. And then, of course, there's warranties that comes with it and all that. But, but they're all related, right? So a good finished product, a quality assurance product, has a couple of things. You can refund it. Get your, you know, you, can, you have a warranty on it. Sometimes a limited or a lifetime warranty. Then you have, you, you have to keep your receipt. And then there's a money back guarantee. So quality assurance is very important. It's valuable. And it's necessary. Now, there are some things I've bought in my lifetime. Um, I hope someone can, can relate to me. And, you know, I wanted to, you know, save a little bit of money. So it's called cheaping out sometimes, you know. You save a little money here and there. You cut it. So, you know, there, there are times when, you know, you don't always have to buy name brand items. But my aunt always told me, you pay for what you get and you get what you pay for. Does that make sense? You pay for what you get, and you get what you pay for. So, you know, um, something might be $10 here, but at the other store, I saw it for $4.99. Like, I I can save myself $5 by buying it over the other store. Now, according to the product that's $10, it comes with, you know, money-back guarantee and, you know, warranty, and, you know, it has these guarantees built in. But the other one says, you know, you know, it's limited warranty and um, you have 30 days, but that's for the $4.99 product. But the $10 product says you could return it anytime. You have a lifetime warranty. So what would you pay for? Would you go for the $4.99 product or for the $10 product? Which one would you go for? Let's see how many of you are cheap. I mean, let me just see. I'm just saying. I'm just saying we save. Now, there's stuff that I buy, I, buy, I see at the dollar store that, that is really cheap, but I see it at the other store, and they're charging twice and thrice, three times and four times as much. I'm saying, okay, I got to be discerning, right? I, I got to use common sense and discretion. There's some things I can buy at the dollar store that are just functional, and I know that they won't last forever. Obviously, not everything that you buy at the dollar store lasts forever, right? It's usually a one time or two time and use, and that's pretty much it. You realize that when you go cheap, It's more on the expendable list. That means, you know what? Don't expect to keep it, preserve it for a long time, right? Because you paid so less and so cheap for it, right? But you notice, so I've experienced this, and, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, phony stuff going on. In fact, I was listening to the news the other day, and they said one of the biggest scam malls is called the Pacific Rim Mall in Markham. How many of you have been there? You You can get the 
devices that are like so cheap, like Bluetooth stuff, tablets, phones, whole bunch of stuff made in China. And all, I, mean, I mean, it's one of the biggest, and it came out in the news, right? It's, and they say that Canada has one of the biggest counterfeit markets. I go, wow, that's amazing. And that mall is one of the biggest counterfeit ones. I bought uh, something there, and I had to take it back, and I had to argue with someone. And instead of, when I bought it from him, he was speaking English. When I went to take it back, he was speaking Chinese. You figured that one out. Anyways, it's like he, you know, got up on the wrong side of the bed that morning and didn't understand what I was saying. Um, nevertheless, I, you know, I was persistent like a hound dog, like a, a bulldog, and I made sure I got, you know, my money back after some, you know, you know minor disruption, disturbances. But, uh, you know, quality assurance is important. That's the thing. You buy those things. Nothing guaranteed. How many of you like to live in a house like this? Man, they did a poor job on the roof. Look at that. There's no quality assurance here. There's two different set of shingles, different color shingles. The house looks like it's falling apart. Where, who signed off on that one? That, that didn't meet quality assurance standards. Did it meet it? It surely didn't meet it. That's terrible. And then there are people who like to go for this. Half price sale on products we've made before instituting a quality control program. How about that? Right? I, I hope not. I hope that's not the type of person you are. I'm sure. And, and looking, at, looking at you all from up here, you know, you all are wearing designer clothes. And I smell some of you this morning. That's not dollar store fragrances. Anyways, um, let's keep going. So we always look for this, right? Quality assurance. Quality assurance. That check mark ensures that this product has been thoroughly inspected from start to finish and they put their sign and their seal on the product okay now let's bring it closer to home are you ready let's make the application let's bring it now to the christian life could there be should there be a quality assurance sign and seal what do you think mm, help me out today i want you to understand something watch where i'm going with this so so do you think god has a sign and seal for the christian believer what do you think Okay, so, so, so we all started out like the product. We started out, we all had a beginning, an origin. But it doesn't mean we stay there. It means that it must go through the process in order to be completed to its finished position. Does that make sense? Now, going through the process is not easy because sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's disruptive. Sometimes it irks you and makes you come out of your comfort zone and puts you in a very difficult zone. It's very important. Maybe you might have to go through some heat. You have to go through some testing, some things that will make you feel very uncomfortable and unnerved. But in, in order to get to the finished product, you must go through it. God has designed it for you and I. You know, I was reading my devotion this week. It says, it says this, uh, Saving grace has been designed for every believer. God's saving grace has been designed for every believer. In other words, that God can give us the grace that we need to go through what we're going through to get us where we need to be in Him. So, I want to share with you really quickly. You know these definitions. I don't want to bore you with definitions because I'm going to move a little quickly as we had a packed service today and I want to stay uh, on the timeline. So, this is a word that we all understand. I don't think I need to define that for you, but you can make, uh, take a quick glance and just let it register in your frontal lobe. Here it is. Covenant, we know what it is. Basically, agreement of two equal parties, um, and it means a covenant relationship is bilateral. But where I want to take you, and then I talked about the sign and the seal, right? But where I want to take you is that not only is it an agreement, but the word is used in the Old Testament. This word is called bereth. And bereth is a Hebrew word, which means to cut, hence a covenant is a cutting, with reference to the cutting of or slaying or sacrifice of animals. That's where we get that blood covenant. And you've got to understand why blood covenant is important. Okay, so when sacrifices are made or were made in the Old Testament, it was done by blood. The blood represented, it was signed and sealed. It was a covenant by sacrifice. That means... That means it was unalterable. It could not be uh, changed or revoked. That was the important. Now, we see today, in a counterfeit way, many false sacrifices. There are many false sacrifices. In fact, not to go there, but I'm just going to make a quick reference. Those that, who do not serve God, 
and who intentionally serve the enemy, in many cases involved in that type of activity of darkness, there are sacrifices by blood. And why am I telling you this? Is because whatever God has done, the enemy has created a counterfeit for. Her. There's always a false system. So you've got to understand the value and the importance of a blood sacrifice. It means something. It's significant, not to be taken lightly. So, so the basic elements of a covenant are embedded in the Genesis story or account. In that narrative, we know that God in His revelation of creation presented Himself as what? As the Creator. He is the covenant God and the covenant Creator. Why is that so important? Because He says this, I will be your God and He wants us to be His people. Does that make sense? Okay, let's keep building our case for today. So the historical record of what He has done was outlined really quickly. He created his, us in His image. We are His image bearers by means of which He placed and kept man and woman in a close relationship with Himself and had them mirror or reflect and represent Him within the created cosmos. Does that make sense? Okay, you got to understand where I'm going with this. Follow with me. Just hold on. Stay a little longer with me. You'll understand it when we get to the big picture. So God created us in His image so to reflect and to represent Him within the created cosmos. That was the covenant when He created us. Okay? Then, humanity was given certain stipulations or mandates as image bearers they were to maintain an intimate and obedient fellowship with their creator, the covenant creator God. The Sabbath, watch this now, the Sabbath was to affirm and confirm this covenant. Now somebody says to me, well, it doesn't matter what day you go to church, it doesn't matter... Yeah, we, we should worship God every day of the week, seven days a week, 24-7. But there is a particular day that God Himself has set aside. It's called your divine date or your divine appointment. That day, God has chosen above all other days as a covenant sign between Himself and His people. Does that make sense? The Sabbath then, and if you read those texts, you'll see. The Bible talks about it. Ezekiel talks about it. That's my sign between you and I, right? If you keep my Sabbaths, that's a sign between you and I. God was very particular. God never changed it. It still exists today. So when you look at God, I'm not keeping a Sabbath because it's the fourth commandment of the ten. Exodus 20. I'm not keeping a Sabbath because I have to do so legalistically and be a law-abiding citizen. I want to be. I'm keeping the Sabbath because it represents my covenant love relationship with God. I'm keeping the Sabbath because I love my God, because He wants to have covenant with me. I'm not worthy for that. Are you worthy for that? This past 10 days, we're talking about um, the high priest, and one of the topics is holiness. And we explored it um, we explored it a few days ago, and today we're having our study at 2.30. So if you missed it, we invite you to come back or stay back for 2.30's uh, study today. It continues on that. And one of the things about the Sabbath is that the Sabbath is a holy day. So let me ask you a question. Are you holy? Is anyone here? Is anyone claim to be holy here? Okay. So does anyone claim to be holy? Yes, through Jesus. Now, the Sabbath is holy. When we keep the Sabbath that is holy, do we become holy? Well, understand something. That, that's why you've got to come back to the study for later on today. But, but holiness is not only the name of God, but it also represents who He is by character and nature. He is holy. God wants us to be holy. And as we live for Him, as He lives in us, He makes us holy. I'll take you to the text as we close in a few minutes. So, as Yahweh had promised that His redemptive, restorative covenant in the broader context of creation covenant was to be continued with Abraham. He had obeyed Yahweh and kept His laws. You remember God told him to do what? Take his what? His only son and do what? I know no parent here would do that. I know none of you would do that. You say, God, you've got to be... <laughs> out of your mind. You must be crazy, God. I am not touching my, my son or my daughter, my firstborn. No. But God did that to establish the covenant with Abraham. He was testing his faith. How much do you love me? How much are you loyal to me? That was the test. That's all. 
God wasn't there to kill or slay innocent life. Not at all. That's not the God. But he wanted him to understand the importance of what it means to enter into a covenant with him. And today, brothers and sisters, I appeal to you. Do you understand what it means to enter into a covenant with God? Sometimes we just keep the Sabbath. We go to church for three hours. We forget about the Sabbath for the other, uh, what, the other 21 hours of the day. That's not, that's not fair to God. You're robbing God. You're robbing yourself. You've got to understand what it means to enter into a covenant relationship with the living God. It is a privilege and an honor, just not a right. Don't take it lightly. Don't shrug it off. Don't sweep it under the carpet. We take that for granted. God is going to hold you and I accountable for that. Because this Sabbath is a covenant sign with our God and Himself. And so there's a lot of people who are loose and lax about the way they keep Sabbath, the way they honor God. Very laissez-faire in their attitude. It's time to change for 2018. Are you with me? It's time to change because we're nearing the kingdom of God. I want to be there. How about you? Let's not allow this world and the busyness of this world to cause us to lose our grip on God. God has called us to re-covenant with Him, to know who He is. And when we know who He is, the way we live our lives is altogether different. It must be different. It has to be different. And people in the world must know that you and I are sons and daughters of the living God. The gracious character of Yahweh's covenant with the patriarchs was highlighted when Yahweh interacted with Jacob. You remember? And chose in spite of his covetousness, deception, and clever manipulation. Remember what he did? What did Jacob do? What did he do? You remember what he did? Man, that was one of the, the first case studies of, of the most deceptive, manipulative, lying story. I mean, that's a, you think about the, the traits, but amazing. But God still honored him. You want to know why? Really tell you, tell you really quickly. What he took was the birthright from his brother Esau, his eldest brother. Was he right in doing it? No. Did he deserve it? Well, let's break this down. Esau didn't care about his birthright. He didn't value the birthright. In fact, he disregarded the birthright and the responsibilities that were associated with the birthright. In other words, it didn't matter if someone took it from him or not. He didn't care because that birthright was actually a sign between God. It was a covenant. And so he didn't care about it. He already had rejected it. So I'm not saying the means by which Jacob got it was right. But Jacob was loyal to God. He honored God. So when he took the birthright, he had a desire to do it. Esau didn't have the desire. And guess what? What is even worse? And hey, that's another sermon. Brother Richie you may have to preach that one at Bronte after I leave, or maybe Alan, one of our elders. That's another sermon all by itself. Esau sold his birthright for a pot of soup. Wow. Now I know some of you ladies make some great soup. You know, I know that, I've tasted some of that, but to sell your spiritual birthright, your heritage for food, that means you have no regard for that covenant that God has called you, to which He has called you. So Jacob took it gladly and honored it, and God restored him despite the way he did it. Then, the book of Exodus commences, and I just want to say, please don't sell your spiritual birthright. Don't compromise your spiritual birthright. God has a calling on your life. Don't sell it cheap to the things of this world or the pleasures of this world. The book of Exodus then begins with the covenantal statements, remember? And we go down. And then uh, Yahweh breaks the powerful Egypt. He releases, He liberates Israel. You know the story and all of that. And so the actual process of confirming the covenant with Israel took place at Mount Sinai. Do you remember that? The stage of the process included what? The following. What did he do at Mount Sinai? What did he do, Grandview children? Do you remember? Grandview children, Grandview students. What did, what did God do for Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai? What did he give them? Say it louder. Oh, All right, great. You know your Bible. At least that part of it. That's good. No. That's good. So, understand this. Um, Yahweh presented himself as a covenant-keeping, delivering, guiding, protecting God of Israel who bought, brought Israel to himself. He confirmed the life-love bond. That's powerful. What a bond that God did. So, second, he made an all-inclusive stipulation. Obey my covenant. Third, 
The promise was in the form of four assurances. Are you ready for them? Really quickly. Four assurances, and they included these following responsibilities. One, Israel. And when I say Israel of old, remember you need to make an application for us today because we are modern-day Israel, spiritually speaking. We're spiritual Israel. Israel would realize the life, love, and blessedness of being Yahweh's precious possession chosen from all nations. All nations. Not that they were exclusive, but God called them to be peculiar. Okay? Number two. Israel was to be a kingdom, a royal people, children in the family of the sovereign Lord of His cosmic kingdom, imply that all kingdom privileges, blessings, and responsibilities were to be theirs. What a privilege. Do we know what we have? Do we know the type of God we serve? Come on, I don't even think we understand the type of God we serve sometimes. Sometimes. I think sometimes we just, we just think it's just, you know, far-fetched, you know, arm's length, no way. You got to understand. Number three, Israel was as a kingdom to be priestly in character and service. They were to see themselves as standing and serving in the presence of Yahweh as they ministered to on behalf of the nations of the world. Thus, the covenantal task of being a channel of blessing would be realized. That's what God has called us to be here at Bronte. Not to be insular and isolated, but to open the doors and to serve and to be the agent of change and transformation in this surrounding community. I tell you, if a church does not impact and have an immediate impact on this community, then what's the purpose of the church? Then you can join any private yacht club or elite club. That's not what the church exists for. The church exists to be the agent of change in this community. And I believe we're striving and moving that direction by God's grace here at Bronte. Number four, Israel was to be sanctified, dedicated, and a consecrated nation. As an organized people, truly ruled by Yahweh, they were to avoid and fight against sin and corruption and reflect the purity, majesty, and grandeur of their holy Lord among the nations. The question is, do we reflect that among the community and this world and the society? Do we do that? We must do better. We must come up higher by the grace of God. Finally, Israel responded covenantally, we will do everything Yahweh has said. They did not say we choose to. They were not given an option or we will try. They made a full commitment. Of course, many times they reneged on that. They re retreated, right? They went back many times. They regressed. But God was merciful and God is gracious and He is for you and I today. How many times have we said, Lord, we'll do everything that you say. And then tomorrow, next week comes and we forget about what we said to the Lord. We're no different, or shall I say, no better than the children of Israel of old. Yet God is merciful and gracious. And what a wonderful God we serve. How many times has He given us second and third and fourth and multiple chances to have a living relationship with Him, to get it right with Him, to reconnect with Him, to make our calling and election sure. God is abundantly merciful. And when that day should come, and people who never made it to the kingdom... They can never say that God did not do enough to save them. Neither did He do enough to save you. And He done everything to save you and I. And I think the least we can do is give our all back to Him. He deserves it. So, do you remember this? The covenant of works. This is what it used to be. It was when Adam was created, placed at His creation. The parties was God, the moral governor, and Adam, a free moral agent, Representative all the nat of the natural posterity gave. The promise was life. The condition was perfect obedience to the law. We knew what happened. They ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They sinned and the penalty was death. This was under the covenant of works. Something had to happen. The first blood sacrifice happened in Genesis. Did you read that? Did you ever read that? Remember that? When they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, God said that wasn't enough. That covering didn't fit. It wasn't sufficient. He put skin, goat skin, either it was goat skin or animal skin on them because that's what the Bible says. An animal was sacrificed. Who sacrificed it? Who did it? God covered them in the blood, representing that His Son would come one day and be the ultimate sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice once and for all. For the entire human family. The covenant is called covenant of nature. The tree of life was the outward sign and seal 
of that life which was promised in the covenant and hence it is usually called the seal of that covenant. It was taken away from the garden, by the way, because if they ate of that tree, they would be immortal sinners. So God had to put a flaming sword and then eventually remove that tree. But the Bible says one day, if we're faithful, we'll get to eat of the tree again. So from the covenant of works, it now moves to the covenant of grace. Stay with me. Just bear with me a few more minutes. Just bear with me. Thank you, children, for your patience and your attention. Just a few more minutes. The covenant of works moves now to the covenant of grace. Watch this now. The eternal plan of redemption entered into by the three persons of the Godhead and carried out by them in several parts. It is in the Father. The Father represented the Godhead in its indivisible sovereignty and divinity. The Son as our Savior, our substitute, and our surety. What a Savior we have. And the Holy Spirit as comforter, guide, and teacher. Can you imagine all three working for our salvation? I use the term Yahweh, which is also interchangeably used with the term Jehovah. And when we use the word Yahweh or Jehovah, you know what that means? It is in the original lang language the plural name for God. It's not a singular name. So when we say the plural name for God, we're talking about the entire Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So they understood it then. And we need to understand it now. I know our friends who are Jehovah Witness, Witnesses, they don't understand that because a simple linguistic study would resolve their issue and that entire denomination would probably cease to exist. But that's what it is. God works for us. The entire Godhead works for our salvation. So that's what it looks like uh, pictorially as a diagram. I won't go through that, but God, God moved us from the old covenant. We were once under the law, but we're under grace now. Grace does not dispense of the law. It enables us to keep the law. That's what it does. Praise God for being under the new covenant of grace. So, can everyone read that with, uh, with me? Uh, let's read that together after three. One, two, three. So, for he what? That? Wow, did you hear that? Well, that, that's, a, that's a profound text. That's a profound text. He was made, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Do you understand the depth and implication of that verse? Jesus did no sin. He did not sin. He was tempted to sin, but he did no sin. But he took your sins and my sins, and God placed it upon him to be the sin bearer. To sacrifice his life for you and I. Do you understand? That is the, that's the depth and the height and width and breadth of God's love and the sacrifice he made. How could someone holy and sinless now be placed with sin? That's, that is only God's great sacrifice and love for you and I. Let's read this one together. Now this is our scripture text. Let's read this together. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you ought to be in the meantime in holy behavior? That is, in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer and in godliness displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God. That's from the, I like using the amplified uh, version of, of the Bible. Watch this now. So, as we, as, we, as we close our message on the covenant today, what kind of people does God want us to be? Can you turn to your neighbor, right and let's say, can you say covenant? Just say covenant. Just say covenant. Say covenant. God is inviting you into covenant with Him. What kind of people? So when God started working on you over here as, as the beginning product, you're supposed to be going through a process so you can reach the finished product. The question is, well, sometimes we can't determine where we are on the continuum. But all I do know is this. If God started us here, which He has started all of us, He wants to get us to the finished product. What do you think? He wants to put that final stamp of approval and seal on you. Quality assurance Christianity. Quality assurance living. He's saying you ought to be different. Holy behavior. That there is a pattern of living that sets you apart as a believer displaying and demonstrating our attitude toward God, our awesome God. People will see it. There will be a difference. There's got to be a difference. 
We can't continue business as usual for 2018. It's got to be different, brothers and sisters. While you earnestly look for and await the coming day of God, for on this day the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the material elements will melt with intense heat. Now, we know that God is in control of nature, right? And I often tell you this, right? You've heard this in probably prophecy seminars. You're going to hear more about that next week when we have our guest speaker, Pastor Steve Wahlberg. You better plan to be here because he's got some cutting-edge information that's coming out hot off the press. But, but God knows what he's going to do. God, God has reserves in this earth. You know, he's going to call upon those extra reserves later on. When how, how does it burn up? We've got oil that's, that's there deposited deep in the earth's crust. God's going to call upon it when it's time. Because God is in control of nature. He created nature. And it says, But in accordance with His promise, we expectantly await new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness dwells. The question is, are you looking forward to? Are you expectantly awaiting? And the final text there is so beloved. Since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent and make every effort to be found by Him at His return spotless and blameless in peace that is inwardly calm with a sense of spiritual well-being and confidence having lived a life of obedience to him may that be our heart's desire what do you say out there be diligent let's let's come up a little bit higher this year let's strive for more in christ let's grow in our relationship with god i got to share with you five quick guidelines. Jot them down and we'll be out of here. We'll be out of here. Let's, let me share them really quickly. Number one, are you ready? Take, take note. These are freebies for you. You don't have to pay for this. Jesus paid it all. Number one, guideline for growth, prayer. Looking to God in dependence. Number one, looking to God in dependence. i got five for you. you got to take this down for the new year. Take it while you get it. You may not get it next week or ever. Take it while you get it. Guideline for growth, number one, prayer. The looking to God in dependence. So when I pray, when you and I pray, we acknowledge how much we need God. Have you expressed this dependence today and recently, snatching moments to talk with Him and listen for His prompting? The text comes for us from, for us, uh, from Hebrews 4.16. Draw near, come boldly to the throne of grace, etc. Number one, for guideline for growth, prayer. Looking to God in dependence. Number two guideline, you ready for it? Study. Looking in God's word for direction. Looking in God's word for direction. So God, God's word offers us plain, practical counsel and direction. Have you made the study of His word a priority today so that you may know Him better and more clearly follow His will for your life? And there's your power text right there. Psalm 119, verse, 101, verse uh, 105. Actually, that's a typo. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word. Can we read it together? What does it say? Your word is what? And a light unto my path. That's number two. Number three. Number three, guideline for growth. Here it is. Faith. Faith. Looking at my word with God's perspective. And actually, that's a typo. That's world. Looking at my world with God's perspective. Do you believe that God is at work in your life? Even though, even when they, the way seems unclear, have I responded to His truth and direction with complete trust and obedience today? Here's your power text, Hebrews 11, 1 and 6. Now faith is the evidence, the conviction of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Number three, guideline for growth is faith. Looking at my world with God's perspective. Guideline growth, number four. Are you ready for it? Here it is. Guideline number four. If this will work, let's see if it will work again. Yes, it is. Here it is. Number four, outreach. Looking around for God-given opportunities. Looking for God around for God-given opportunities. Do you want to share God's grace with the people He brings into your life? That's important. God allows us to do that. Have you responded to and created opportunities to talk about and model Christ's life with those who have yet to know Him? Think about that. Outreach. Here's your power text. Always be ready to give an answer, a defense, an account to everyone who asks you of the reason of hope that is in you. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Check that out. And five, fifthly, our last one, guideline for growth number five, is accountability. Looking to others 
for godly support. Looking to others. God provides other believers to encourage you in your personal walk with God. Are you wisely entrusting yourself to select relationships that are characterized by vulnerability and authentic love? That's why we're here as a church, to support and encourage one another. And here's your power text found in Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so one man or woman sharpens another. I pray that you'll follow these guidelines for growth. I like this poem that Max Lucado penned. He said, If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But God saw our greatest need, and it was forgiveness, so He sent us a Savior. Thanks be to God for the Savior that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I like Martin Luther. He's one of my favorites. He said this, I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all, but whatever I have placed in God's hands... That I still possess. The 13th day of January, the year is still in its infancy. I pray that you will place your lives in God's hands. That is the safest, the best place you can be at all times. Every day, commit yourself to God, your family, your children. Place yourselves in the hands of God and keeping of your soul to Him. And He will take care of you. Jesus truly paid it all. And I want to tell you that God instituted a quality assurance program long before the foundation of this world. All down through the annals of time, the devil has tried to short-circuit the process, but he could not, though he tried to interfere, God's hand preserved the quality assurance process. That when Jesus came to this earth as born as a babe in Bethlehem, from the cradle to the cross, God ensured that nothing would interrupt or disrupt the quality assurance process so that when Jesus came to the cross, the work that he did was a complete and finished work. And that's why we can sing, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. What a God we serve. I invite you to place your life in His hands. If that's your heart's desire today, I invite you to stand with me as we close our service today. I want my life for this year and every year after until Jesus comes to be placed in His hands.